Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Alicia Garrido and I'm the Vice President of the University of San Diego's Latino Alumni Network. I'm thrilled that you've joined us for today's session titled USD, an Emerging Hispanic Serving Institution, also known as HSI. Without further ado, I would like to introduce today's facilitator, Charles Bass. Charles serves as Senior Director of USD's Office of Alumni Relations. He joined the Torero family nearly 12 years ago and has led the charge in increasing alumni engagement ever since. Charles, welcome to our screen and take it away. Thank you so much, Elisa, Alicia. And thanks to all the members of the Latino Alumni Network uh, leadership team for your support of this program. It's now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Gregory Prieto. Greg joined the sociology faculty at USD in 2013. He teaches primarily in the law, criminal, uh, law, crime, and justice concentration. His research interests lie at the intersection of race, racism, and legal violence. His primary focuses are Mexican immigration, police and border patrol, and social movements. Greg has been instrumental in USD's effort to become a Hispanic serving institution. Please, uh, Greg, please turn on your camera and welcome to our program. Greetings. Thanks for that wonderful introduction, Charles. Well, so glad to have you with us. I've got some questions. And just so the audience knows, we uh, have a number of questions that you asked in advance uh, via your registration. So we're going to try to get to all of those, as well as you want, if you'd like to use the Q&A feature, please feel free to do so. So, Greg, let's just... Uh, jump right into it. Can you can you share with our alumni audience what an HSI is? Sure thing. So a Hispanic Serving Institute, as defined by the U.S. Department of Education, is an institution that enrolls 25% Hispanic and Latino full-time students. USD is currently at 23%, and we anticipate we'll cross this eligibility threshold in 2025. But I want to also say that more than these numeric eligibility requirements, being an HSI means that the institution has undertaken work to admit, retain, and graduate Latinx students from institutions that have responded to the challenges that many of our students face attending higher education, but also to celebrate and honor their contributions to our campus community, right? So it's about hitting that numeric threshold, but it's also about making sure that USD is prepared um, to receive, lift up, and honor these students once they arrive. Yeah, I think the retention and graduation are the are, are the key points of that, right? To, to Something we'll talk more make, about in just a second. Yeah, setting the the platform. So, That's so right. tell us, uh, you know, why is USD pursuing this designation? Would you say? Um, so I think there are three big reasons for me. I think the first is about mission alignment. Um, we have two um, pieces of our strategic plan around access and inclusion. And then around establishing USD as an anchor institution, which basically means to serve the community in which USD is situated. And as a historically marginalized group, enhancing access means opening doors that have previously been closed to Hispanic and Latinx students. So this designation signals our efforts to improve access for this historically excluded group, to deepen our anchor commitment by better serving those students who are already living in our communities. Um, and this means especially Latinos, since this is such a large population here in San Diego and in Linda Vista where USD is. So I think that's one big piece, right? This is an extension of our mission. I think the second one is a little bit more um, logistical and strategic, and this has to do with the demographic cliff that many um, institutions of higher education are facing all across, the uh, all across the United States. So across the nation, we're seeing large dips in the population of graduating high school seniors. This, of course, raises a challenge for universities who will have to compete for a smaller and smaller number of prospective students. But here in Southern California, we're lucky to continue to experience robust population growth, especially among Latinos in the region. So earning the HSI designation signals to this important group of students that we are prepared to support their needs, that they are welcome on our campus, and that indeed recruiting these students is essential to the ongoing survival and success of USD as a university. So that's number two. The last one for me is about recognition and celebration. I think one thing that I was reflecting on in preparing for this interview is that Latinx students on our campus have long made up a significant minority of students, but they've often felt sidelined. So part of this effort is also to dignify, to celebrate, to lift up those students who've already made a tremendous impact on our campus 
through student organizations, through their activism in our classrooms, and as this group knows, in our networks after graduation. So this effort centers their contributions and celebrates their achievements. Fantastic. And is this a federal designation that we're pursuing? This is not a federal designation. So what we're pursuing is the HSI designation through a national organization called HAPU or the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. So let me say a little bit about why those two things are different. So we're pursuing the HAPU designation and not the federal one because the federal one also comes with a federal financial aid criteria, which is that 50% of our students need to receive some form of federal need-based financial aid. Right now, that figure at USD is closer to 25%. Um, so we would need to continue to diversify our undergraduate population and recruit from more working class and poor families in order to earn that federal designation, which comes with some major federal grant opportunities. In the interim, we're pursuing the Haku designation because it still requires that 25% student threshold, but it also opens up for us a variety of benefits that come with membership in this professional association. So this includes access to resources to guide our campus as we make this transition. This includes conferences and professional development, political advocacy on Capitol Hill, student scholarships and internships, and publicity. So when we achieve this designation, we'll be joining a network of hundreds of other HSIs whose collective knowledge will help guide our work here at USD. I believe we had we hosted the president of Haku just uh, right. recently, I'm sure you were. Just there. very recently, I was at that luncheon and we learned a lot about how to earn the designation and also what benefits um, we might enjoy once we get it. Well, let's talk about that benefits. Um, how will this impact the student experience, this HSI designation? So. From my perspective, I think the HSI designation really works to amplify and consolidate work that's already been happening on our campus for many years. So let me offer some examples. So for instance, on the topic of access, we have retained our test blind admission policy um, from the COVID period, which helps diversify our incoming classes. We are also expanding the Torero Promise program, which basically guarantees admission to students with a particular GPA, which I believe is 3.7, from a variety of diocesan schools in the region. So by expanding those programs and by retaining that policy, we improve access for Latinx students all across Southern California. Um, on the front of retention, we have a learning communities program that all students participate in, but that has been essential for uh, enhancing the retention of all students, including Latinx students. We have, and I really wanna highlight here, the student, um, the uh, student success, what is SSS? The student success services yeah, program on our just campus. Just about SSS. <laughs> Absolutely. So SSS has been around for a while on our campus, but really what it means is it's a dedicated program for students from underrepresented backgrounds to receive all sorts of one-on-one -on -one support around classwork, around um, choosing classes, around forming community, about meeting professors and connecting with faculty. This program has been essential and tremendously um, productive and effective in retaining our students. So we also anticipate the expansion of the SSS program as we make this march toward the, SA, uh, the HSI designation. We also recently hired a new vice provost for diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's Dr. Regina Dixon-Reeves, who also co-chairs the HSI council that I co-chair alongside her. On the curricular front, we have courses focusing on Latinx issues and the border. This is a direct expression of campus-wide efforts to diversify our faculty, right? When we diversify our faculty, we diversify our courses, and now our students can see themselves more clearly reflected in their curriculum. On the co-curricular side, we have Latinx Greek life. We have wonderful student organizations like Mecha and Acha, the cultural groups like the Folklorico group, the Mariachi group. Um, and through our community engagement, through our Mulvaney Center, we are, um, they have just relaunched their border immersion trips. And these are opportunities for classes or other groups on campus to go down to the border, to cross into Mexico and to learn what's happening um, on the border right now. There's more that I could say here on the public relations front, certainly on the postgraduate front, this alumni network and the robust career development opportunities that we see in our career readiness programs. All of this 
all of this supports the retention and graduation of our Latinx students, but also their life afterwards. And so what we hope to do on the HSI Council is really to amplify these already existing efforts by recommending new programs, but more often by recommending additional resources for those programs we already have. This looks like more staff for SSS. This looks like an HSI public relations campaign. Among faculty, this looks like a curricular audit of our syllabi to see where and how we could diversify the sources, the information, the scholarship that we are presenting to students. And this also looks like things like programming through university ministry, which has recently um, dedicated a whole bunch of programming to Latinx themes. So, right. This is what we're doing on our HSI Council, but I also want to offer a little bit of a broader context here, which is through the Horizon Project. So the Horizon Project was um, a response really to student activism on our campus, calling for greater diversification at all levels of campus life. And this HSI designation is just one part of that initiative. And the Horizon Project does a number of things, but what it's done most effectively, I think, is to raise significant sums of money for student scholarships and for the expansion of some of our most effective programs, two of which you've heard me mention already, that Student Success Services, or SSS, and this Torero Promise. And so the HSI Council, as a part of the Horizon Project, is working to amplify the good work that I think is already taking um, place on our campus and to deliver it more directly and effectively to our Latinx students. Yeah, that, that project is so important, and I encourage people to go to our website and, and read about it. It's uh, funded uh, in part by the Board of Trustees uh, in a five-year commitment to make certain that we're not just, we're, we're, we're walking the talk, not just talking. And, uh, you know, as you said, the, re the retention piece is so important. The, the bringing all these students to campus, uh, making certain that they have every uh, opportunity to succeed and to enhance the USD community in so many ways. Um, and so right. this is really important. And, you know, the, you kind of just covered it, but a little bit, um, but just how would you say, uh, particularly for alumni, how are Latinx mm -hmm. students faring today? Fantastic. So I am a sociology professor, which means that I have brought some data. So please do not panic. I will keep it brief. Um, but I think it is the best way to show you um, where our Latinx students are and how they're doing at USD. So I'd like to share just three data points with you. The first is about the first year transition. So among our first year students, we do a survey and we ask all of them, um, how are you faring now that you're at USD? Then I'll also show you some data related to retention and then graduation. So let's start with the first of those. Just give me one moment, I'll share a screen here. All right, so what you're looking at on this slide is our fall 2020 transition survey data. And students were asked, as you'll see right here, to relate their level of agreement on a five point scale. So five means they strongly agree, one means they strongly disagree. And if we scroll down here, you'll see two highlighted rows. The row that's on top is for non-Hispanic students. The highlighted row on bottom is for our Hispanic or Latinx students. And then you see at the top of each of those columns, the survey question that was asked of them. So let's just take the very first one on your far left to begin. So it says, before the start of the semester, I felt prepared for college level courses. And what we see from the non-Hispanic population is that that number was 3.9, right? Approaching four, not quite five on that one to five scale. And then if you compare that to that second row, you'll see that our Latinx students um, reported agreeing with the statement at a rate of 3.74. So we see that there's a little lag there, but by and large, our Latinx students are on par with the broader USD student population, at least in that first year. And as you move across those columns, looking at, um, I know how to study effectively, I'm able to manage my time effectively, I've done well on my assignments so, uh, so far this semester, we see that in every category, Latinx students get very close to, but don't quite match the non-Hispanic um, non population at USD. So for me, what does that mean qualitatively? I think that just simply means that um, we're doing pretty well, but there's room to improve here. So that gives you a little bit of a window onto the experience for their first year students. Let's zoom out now to some of these other data that I think capture the whole experience at USD. And this has to do with retention and then graduation. So what you should be seeing now are our fall to fall retention and persistence rates. And this time we're gonna break it out by race and ethnicity. Of course, I just restarted the page. So give me one second to come back. Here we go. So you've got a couple of lines on your screen. 
You've got the gray one that means they returned to um, in their first spring semester at USD. So that means they came in in the fall, they stuck around to the spring. First year retention, they stuck around for the first year to the end of the first year. Second year, they stuck around to the end of the second, third to the end of the third, yep. And so what you're looking at in these lines are the overall rates for the entire USD population. So let's just take one of these lines. Let's take this first gray line at the top, the return during the first spring semester. And you'll see for all students in fall 2022, that number was 96%. If I toggle this and switch it to Hispanic or Latino students, especially or specifically, we see that number jumps up to 98%. And we can do the same thing for the other lines. I won't bore you with all four, but let's just jump down to that dark blue line at the bottom. That's your three-year persistence rate. You'll see for the entire US population, that value is 81%. What happens when we specify Hispanic or Latino? That jumps up to 84%. So on the persistence and retention front, I'd say we're faring pretty well. And that Latinx students are faring a little bit better than the overall USD population. Last one graduation, the one that we care a lot about here, which is do these students who we uh, admit, right, persist to graduation and graduate. So same deal, you've got a couple different graduations here, the four, five, and six year graduation rate, which are from top to bottom on your screen. Apologize for the auto refresh there. And we'll do the exact same thing. We'll compare these figures for the overall USD population to that figure for Hispanic and Latino students. So let's start with the four-year graduation rate. We see that it's 69% for all students at USD. For Hispanic and Latino students, that number jumps up to 73%. Um, and again, we won't go through all three of these. Um, these lines, but I'd also like to focus on the six year graduation rate because that's the one that's sort of held out um, at the national level as sort of the key metric for measuring student success of any university in the US. So let's look at that six year graduation rate again for all students. We see that value is 83%. We narrow into Hispanic and Latinx students, that number jumps up to 89%. And I would ask our audience to compare that to the national figure, which is 63%. So both relative to all students at USD and relative to the national average, I'd say our Latinx students are doing pretty well. So again, qualitatively taking all of that together, what do I think it means? I think they're doing pretty well. Um, I think there's room for improvement, especially in those first year transition measures. Um, but I also anticipate that as we increase access to a greater and more diverse um, Latinx student group, we're going to have students who are somewhat less prepared than their traditional cohorts have been. And for me, this just reinforces the goals of the HSI initiative of the Horizon Project to not only focus on recruitment, but also on retention, graduation, and postgraduate life. And that brings us back to all of those initiatives and examples that I offered in the previous question. Yeah, um, I, I, a lot of ways to enhance the support of our Latinx students. And you mentioned many of those. Um, and, and those are ideas that come from both the HSI council, from faculty um, um, and, and more. So, uh, and you mentioned a little bit about this earlier, but how does the, uh, how would you say that our pursuit of the HSI designation aligns with USD's mission? The, sort of, the way that I see this is that when we pursue this designation, it just calls attention. It invites our university to center this work um, as a priority for the campus. So when I think about what the HSI designation is, I again sort of situate it in that broader context that I think is the Horizon Project and this general push on our campus to diversify and to recruit um, a more diverse student population. So let me just offer some um, perhaps slightly more concrete examples about the work of amplification and consolidation that I mentioned um, previously. So for instance, and again, one of the main priorities of the Horizon Project is the expansion of that SSS program, which has done wonders for recruiting and retaining students from all marginalized populations, but that includes Latinx students as well. So expanding the number of staff and the reach of their programming will go a long way to deepening the impact of this proven program. 
right? Um, student scholarships are another big part of the Horizon Project, and they address the biggest barrier to access for our Latinx students, which is simply the cost. So bringing more scholarships online helps these students see themselves as a member of our USD community from the very first day that they're admitted. On the faculty side, we're doing a curricular audit to determine how many courses with Latinx themes appear across the curriculum. And then this summer, we're planning um, a faculty development event that's meant to bring faculty who are already deeply immersed in the DEI work on our campus into conversations with those who are newer to it so that they can learn to diversify their own syllabi and to collaborate with other faculty in the development of new courses with Latinx themes. Right, so this is one thing that we're doing on the curricular side. At the administrative level, our VP of DEI, again, that's Dr. Regina Dixon-Reeves, has done tremendous work on our campus, ensuring that faculty hiring happens from a diverse pool, that our promotion and um, tenure processes are fair, and that they appreciate the often invisible labor that our faculty perform supporting our Latinx students. She's also launched a campus-wide training series that's designed to enhance belonging and inclusion for all first-year students. And then finally, I'd flag that um, one of my other roles on campus is to work closely with our undocumented students, um, the vast majority of whom are unsurprisingly Latinx here in Southern California. And one signature achievement of that work has been the creation of a room and board scholarship um, that helps students who are legally excluded to be substantively included on our campus. And so these are just some of the ideas that the HSI Council, working within this broader um, campus context, are doing to help amplify those resources that we already have. And I think really what the HSI designation of this drive for that designation means is simply that our administrative leaders all the way um, down to faculty, staff, and students are oriented to this work. And when you couple that with an infusion of actual concrete material resources through the Horizon Project, I think we're in a pretty good position um, to help our Latinx students hit those metrics um, uh, just like any other student on our campus can. Yeah. Here's a great time for a commercial. Uh, if you go to San Diego.edu, up at the top, up there somewhere in there, the top is a giving button. You push giving and you can make a you can make a donation that will directly support our students through student scholarships. So uh, that's our official commercial. So um, let's uh, get back to the important questions. Uh, how do you envision this uh, uh, designation impacting the alumni base moving forward? Great question. Um, so I think more Latinx students means more Latinx alums, which means a deeper and richer community of support that all of us can tap into. One of the biggest opportunities that I see as a faculty member who works daily with students who are graduating and trying to imagine life after college is around career readiness. So I think our Latinx, getting our Latinx students in touch with business, nonprofit, and governmental leaders in San Diego and beyond who can help them discern their career path after graduation is one key way that the HSI designation is going to help this alumni base move forward. And that's really also an invitation to all the alums out there, including the ones on this call, um, to think about ways that they can collaborate with our university, right, through donations, of course, right, but also through... Um, your jobs, right? Is there something in your own work experience that you can share with our students that will help them envision their own path? Yeah. Think of those things that you missed as a student that that right. you could probably possibly help as an alum, whether it's hiring fellow Toreros or uh, hiring, uh, coming to our career fair, coming to speak to students in classes. We love to help with those opportunities right. when we can. Um, there was a question that you you touched on the answer. How does USD hope to reflect the Hispanic Latinx student body at the faculty level? Um, mm -hmm. Again, you mentioned reflecting. Yeah. Uh, you know that reflection uh, yeah. is important. So, I don't know if you want to enhance that. Sure. Answer. Yeah, we could talk a little bit more about that. So, I think. I think implicit in your question is, you know, how is this not just about the students and hitting that 25% numeric threshold? How is this also about changing the culture on our campus? And I think that happens perhaps most powerfully among faculty because we are the ones who are going to be interacting with students the most consistently on this day-to-day -day basis. 
Um, and so again, I think the HSI designation is really an opportunity for um, the whole campus community to come together in support of work that's been going on for a while through the diversification of our faculty body. So that's happened in a couple of ways, right? We undertook cluster hiring um, several years ago in the college, and this is an opportunity, right, to hire multiple faculty in multiple different disciplines, but around a, uh, a common theme like environmental sustainability or the border. Um, that has been an effective program at diversifying our faculty numbers, as has bringing on this VP of DEI, who's really worked closely with departments to make sure that their processes and their hiring pools, their rank and tenure processes are fair and appreciate the labor that our diverse faculty often put in with these student populations, labor that is not always visible in um, the traditional rank and tenure process. And so so the HSI designation has really, I think, just sort of lent this broader um, campus administrative support to those ongoing efforts. And so certainly I have been involved in these efforts and will continue to be involved. But as we diversify our faculty body, we become better prepared to serve a diverse student body who can now see themselves reflected in their faculty, but not just in our faces, right? But in our syllabi, in what they're reading and the assignments they're completing. Um, when they address issues that are closer to their experience, to their hearts, right? I think we connect more deeply and profoundly with those students. That's, that's great. Um, let's ask some of these questions we got via the registration. And um, the, the first I'd like to bring, bring up, what's a word of advice you'd like to share with, uh, with uh, Latinos who are considering attending USD? I think, and I have this conversation with some regularity with the, with my students, right? Whether I'm working with undocumented students, whether I'm working with first year students, and that is the essential importance of finding your community when you get here. One of the things that we know from the scholarship on higher education is that having a holistic experience of belonging and inclusion is at the foundation of being a successful student, right? So we could throw at you study skills, peer coaches, one-on-one -on -one office hours, mentorship, as much as we want. But unless that student has a group, has found their tribe on campus, they will not be as successful as they possibly can be. So my first word of advice to all students, but especially to Latinos who've historically been excluded from institutions like ours, is to find that community. That could look like Mecha or Acha. That could look like our um, Latinx Graduate Student Association. That could look like participating in the cultural groups on campus. I mentioned Folklorico and Mariachi, right? Any of those that bring students into community is an essential ingredient to making sure that they are successful and that they hit those milestones that we talked about just a moment ago, right? Around retention, around graduation, around feeling like you belong at this university. I was just at a meeting uh, an hour ago about mm -hmm. our summer send-off program, or mm -hmm. uh, I think it's about half of the, the incoming student population attends one of the 25 or so in-person summer send-offs, as well mm -hmm. as two or three that are in uh, that are virtual, including a, a Spanish-speaking one on on the USD campus. And in addition to talking about the the importance of the retention rate of students who attend those, we also mm -hmm. talked about Torero circles as a new, uh, you know, based on this restorative justice model, it's been, uh, they're about, I think we've done them for about four years. And the, the it, it's an, a kind of an instant way to help start that process of finding that community, finding your people, your your tribe, as you mentioned. Um, right. And it, the, re the response rate of students that mm -hmm. were surveyed afterwards, 95% of them find that as uh, to be, a really critical and helpful resource. So, um, so absolutely, yeah, that makes so much sense. Yeah, and we see similar program, right? Again, I'll highlight that SSS program. They have a program called Summer Bridge, which is designed mm -hmm. to help students who will be participating in SSS um, be successful from the first day on USD's campus, right? So they're here. Um, on campus during the summer at the same time as the athletes and other students who come early. Um, and they're going through a series of workshops, panels, community building events that do exactly as you say, which helps them form that community before they ever set foot or before the formal academic semester begins. So they hit the ground running. 
yeah, there's just so much more to just that to it than just going to class. And and exactly. we spend I, it, it sounds crass, but I say to people, we you know, we spend a lot of money on admissions and and on getting students here. We don't want them to leave until they get that piece of paper. So that's uh, right. That's and then right. We don't, then, then they still don't leave because they're Toreros for life. So um, right. talk about the timeline to reach HSI status. Our goal is fall 2025. OK. And it looks like we're going to hit it. As you heard me mention earlier, we're at 23% Latinx students on our campus. So we just need a couple more percentage points to hit that numeric threshold. Um, and then we'll be ready to join the HAKU, not as an emerging HSI, but as an HSI um, in fall 2025. All right. Um, somebody asked a question about the current and future resources for graduate students at USD as related to this. I am a little bit less knowledgeable on this front because I work primarily with our undergraduates, but I have had the opportunity to work with our Latinx Graduate Student Association on a number of different events. That has been a very robust group of students. Um, well, a, a robust group that has done a really good job in supporting students through their graduate education. It also helps bring graduate students from the various programs on our campus across different units and schools together in one place. So having worked with them over the years, I've gotten a front seat to the way that their co-curricular planning um, has supported um, graduate students in particular. I'd also point out that I know that the graduate programs, perhaps especially in Seoul's, that's our School of Leadership and Education Sciences, I believe. Yes. Um, did I get that all right? Yes. Yeah, that they do a ton of internal work within their school um, to support a diverse student body. Um, and so I haven't participated as much, again, because I work primarily with undergraduates, but I'm aware of the programming that goes on there. I know that, for instance, they just had a DEI conference where they had faculty and students coming together to share various DEI work that they have been doing um, as an opportunity to share best practices and build community. So I know that that work is happening in a big way. Um, and I'm not certain, but I also, uh, and maybe you can help me here, Charles, but I believe some of the scholarship money that's being raised through Horizon is available to graduate students as well. It is, I do believe. And, and in addition, we have um, a couple of scholarships, the USD Wine Classic raises money, which mm -hmm. is another commercial USD Wine Classic mm -hmm. uh, Saturday, July 15th, the 15th anniversary event, and that raises money for uh, the Alumni Endowed Scholarship Fund, which is open to all students, as well as there is a scholarship specifically um, provided by the Latin Latino Alumni Network, uh, and that's funded in part by monies from the Wine Classic. And then there's also the Founders Gala or the Founders Endowed Scholarship, and that is available for undergraduate, graduate, and law students, among others. So, all right. Um, what does USD do currently to attract Hispanic students to apply and attend? Um, that was a question we have. Mm -hmm. um, I know that in part, uh, you mentioned the Torero Promise as a as a yep. great uh, resource, and that's going out to the Catholic institution or Catholic higher high schools uh, in several counties. That's right. Uh, other ideas that you might have? Yeah, so on the retention front, so you heard me mention that undocumented student scholarship, that's been a key retention tool for undocumented students, the majority of whom are Latinx. Um, there was another program that I wanted to flag and it just went right out of my head. So we talked about Torero problems. Oh, I wanted to lift up the multicultural recruiter in our admissions office. So undergraduate admissions, of course, has a variety of recruiters. And one of those is designated as a multicultural recruiter. And this person has been absolutely essential in going out there to meet with parents at schools, in their homes, virtually in different cities, um, often in Spanish, to make sure that they um, that prospective Latinx students have a clear sense of the full array of resources that they might access when they come to USD. So I think through sort of policies like that, right, Torero Promise, but also through people like the Multicultural Recruiter, this goes a long way um, to helping students envision themselves at USD. And then you heard, I mean, Charles just mentioned it a moment ago, the Alumni Office does all sorts of programming with our alums all summer long, right, designed to bring in the next generation, right? So these are all the various outreach efforts that happen on USD's campus to bring these students in. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, this, I think the numbers are in and the final uh, account in terms of applications from all students mm -hmm. was the second highest amount ever. So um, that's, that's right. That's a, a good healthy sign um, another banner year for us yeah yes. definitely a healthy sign we're glad for it 
Yeah, um, and about 1,300 first-year students will be enrolling, which is a little bit higher than than expected. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's a, that's good. Um, you mentioned a little bit um, there, and and the submission recruiter does a lot of work. Uh, question here about uh, how you know. Usually, let this is a question from Martha. Is usually Latino students and families consider private universities to be too expensive, and yeah. they assume they don't have any possibilities. We've talked a lot about through the Trail Promise and other scholarship avenues, but how can we help change that perception? I really appreciate this question because I think it's only in our recent history that Catholic universities have sort of gotten this reputation as sort of bastions of elite education. I think when you dig into the history though of the Catholic university, you had the opportunity to do this with a colleague at a conference on a panel. And what she reminded me of is way back in the 1900s, early 1900s, turn of the century, um, that when Italians, when Poles came to the United States, they had an incredibly difficult time accessing mainstream education in the US, right? Because they were faced with discrimination, they were faced with prejudice. And so where did they go to get that education? They went to a parallel institution that their communities helped build, that the Catholic Church helped build, that is the Catholic University. And so when I think about what the Catholic University should mean to prospective students, that's the tradition that I really, that grounds my work on this campus and I think we are now turning back to. This is not just meant to be the university on the hill that is only for those who are the richest and best prepared to go to college. This is also for students who have been historically marginalized, who are still marginalized in their educational experiences, that USD can be a place not just to celebrate the most elite students, but to celebrate access, to give all students who want education a chance to access the kind of class mobility that education promotes. And so that's really a place that I wanna get back to. And you've heard some of our ideas for how we hope to kind of bend our mission back to that traditional purpose of the Catholic University. Um, I think the biggest one, of course, is the cost. And so the scholarships here are essential. And that's why I was so excited to see the president, the board of trustees, the campus community um, develop the Horizon Project because such a huge piece of that is raising funds for scholarships. That's what's gonna help students um, envision themselves at USD, right? You get your admission letter, but then a week later, right, you get that financial aid package. We love being admitted, but we also wanna be able to see ourselves as being able to afford this place. And with these, resources in, in, with these resources in place, I think we stand a much better chance of helping students envision themselves here. Yeah, that's uh, it's so important. And we're lagging behind uh, some of our peers uh, right. in terms of, I, I get a lot of those calls from yeah. particularly alumni whose children are applying and, and they're, uh, they were accepted, but the costs uh, are sometimes in fact prohibitive. So um, right. it's, 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 but we're doing all we can in the alumni office and the, the office of development, our student callers, answer those phones when they call you, please. Um, how would you, uh, let's, let's jump back to a couple other questions. What are some of the ripple effects of becoming an HSI that USD is discussing and planning for? That's one of the questions from earlier today. Great question. So some of the ripple effects, of course, are, I think, resistance. I think that some in our community will um, articulate in response to the idea that we should have an initiative that is specifically about Hispanic and Latinx students. Um, and so I think part of our work is communicating the value of that message, why this effort is mission aligned, why in deepening these resources, for instance, by expanding SSS actually serves all students. So I think getting that message out there is an important. Um, but I think the biggest ripple effect to me is sort of the direct impact that this initiative is having, which is, again, when we bring our campus's attention centrally to this HSI designation and our administrators are paying attention and our donors are paying attention, our faculty are paying attention, our students are looking at this, we collectively consolidate our energy in pushing this initiative forward and we get real material resources out of it. So what I hope one of the biggest ripple effects is, is more money and more resources for these students so that they can come to USD and they can stay at USD and be successful here. And make the community that much stronger and more vibrant and uh, enrich USD for all. Make it look like the California, the San Diego that we live in now. Excellent. Um, this, uh, uh, Eduardo asks the question, and I'm not sure if you'll know the answer. Does 
recognition, and again, this is not the federal recognition that uh, mm -hmm. HSI, where the um, we're going for the recognition from the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. Does That's right. federal recognition of being an HSI open up USD to Title III and Title V grants? Federal so, recognition would, okay. but we are not seeking that designation at the present time because we are well short of that 50% threshold, 50% of our students need to be receiving need-based federal financial aid. Currently on our campus, that figure is about 20%. There's a separate sort of Pell Grant related um, threshold, sort of an alternative eligibility requirement, but um, the gap between that uh, threshold and where we are is about the same as we'd see for federal work uh, for federal aid in general. Okay. So I um, personally would love to see USD in the next several years reach for that federal designation, because what it means is we would be diversifying um, not just the, sort of the racial diversity of our campus, right, but also its class-based diversity. That to me is very important. Um, and of course, as you're pointing out, it opens us up to that federal money and that's where the big dollars are, right? That's where you get the big, big grants um, to sort of launch and big initiatives on our campus. So that's not our short-term goal, but for me personally, I would love to see USD move in that direction. Well, Greg, I think we're just about out of time. Any, any kind of last thoughts or comments on USD as an emerging HSI and, what, uh, and how, how this is going to transform our institution? I just think, especially after COVID, and especially as we come up to this demographic cliff, right, that universities all across the US are doing this internal work. They're looking inward and asking themselves, who are we? Who are we going to become in the face of these new constraints? And I think there are two sort of competing impulses there, right? One is, and you heard this in one of the questions from our audience earlier, which is, are we just going to become ever more elite, ever more out of reach, ever more expensive, right? Or are we gonna do the work to make our university community look like the communities we hope to serve? And I'm so encouraged by this HSI designation or push for it, because what it says to me is that we value access as much as we value excellence. And that, to me, I think is the best possible thing, a nonprofit, residential, liberal arts institution of higher education can do for its community, is by improving access so every student who wants education has the chance to get it. Um, and so when I think about why I'm involved in this work, why I think conversations like this are important is because they help breathe life into that vision, and it's a vision that I hope we can realize through this HSI designation. Well, fantastic. Your enthusiasm and uh, thank you for your enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is catching, uh, but thank you so much for all the work you're doing uh, to benefit the USD community and particularly our, our Latinx students. Um, and, and just thank you for your time today on this uh, very important topic.